This is unique in the fact that uh, I do about 90%, 85% of what I do is all children. Children with vascular malformations, uh, both of the brain, head and neck, maxillofacial areas. We receive them from newborn, actually, to uh, 19, 18 years of age. Uh, we do, of course, also adults with vascular malformation, uh, but as things are evolving, and you can see how fantastic this course is, and the tremendous progress that has exists. So children are not small adults, and that has happened throughout medicine. There was the general doctor first, then became pediatricians, uh, which was obviously that required different things. So within the vascular lesions of the human body, uh, there's a certain amount of diseases that occur in children's primarily, and that affect children's uh, sometimes exclusively. So uh, based on my practice, I have dedicated myself to improve the treatment in those children, decrease the radiation, uh, decrease the time of the procedure, uh, being very meticulous uh, with the technique, very meticulous with fluids. The small children that are in severe heart problems, uh, with brain problems, if you use the same techniques in adults, you actually could have a lot of harm. So there are dedicated, specific problems that occur in children. There are specific, dedicated challenges, technical, medical, physiological, that are specific for children. And there's even difference between children and newborns. Uh, we have newborns that are born in severe heart failure with a disease called vein of gallon malformation that even treated is lethal within the first year of life. So those children require techniques, for example, we develop techniques to go through the umbilical artery. So we can actually place a catheter from the umbilical artery to enter the body to then navigate into the brain. In this pediatric population, the diseases are rare, so it's very hard to do really trials. Uh, we're more involved in developing uh, devices you know, actually because coming from children, they can be translated towards adults. We also have a lot of patients, or our practice has patients of rare diseases, such as vascular malformation of the maxillofacial area, very difficult to treat. So we have developed techniques like direct percutaneous puncture. Instead of going from the femoral artery and trying to catheterize them, is to actually use 3D angiography or the, the eye guide or the different types of technologies that have been developed for adults and try to use them to place catheters or needles directly into the malformation. And that has changed the whole ball game. We also involve trying to develop things which are called sclerotherapy. Sclerotherapy is a technique in which you inject something that will damage the endothelium. And then the healing of that scarring, of that will produce scarring, will actually sclerose or thrombose or close and scar those vascular malformations they cannot feel. And that includes venous malformation, that includes lymphatic malformations, that includes arteriovenous malformations. And we're using biological substances such as chemotherapeutic agents, bleomycin, for example. And they've made a tremendous change in the outcome of this patient. Actually, we're trying to use more and more ultrasound to guide ourselves to do these procedures. Uh, also within the medical industry of x-rays, we're forcing, the, we're forcing the manufacturers to create things like last image hold, and that with that last image hold uh, will, you know, for example, collimate, uh, try to center uh, memories so that we don't have to radiate these children. Mothers come to me that, you know, and ask me that, will my child have a stroke while you're doing this horrible malformation? They ask me how much radiation are they going to get, or the anesthesia. Well, there, there is a potential role for endovascular radiosurgery, and we, I worked like 15, 20 years ago to try to treat vascular malformations that way. But uh, radiation is a difficult thing to, to, to control, uh, it's a difficult thing to prove, a difficult thing to get approved through a regulatory pathway, like, you know, the Food and Drug Administration and so on. And dangerous for everyone, including you as an operator. There is, everything is danger if it's pro improperly used. You know, if you have a genie, and you let the genie out of the box and there's no control, it can be a very, very dangerous. So I would say that radiation has a potential, uh, but it is not something that, that is around the corner. The 
tools that we have today are pretty much adaptation of adults to children. So we're still at the beginning. Uh, we're very much interested in developing tools that are designed for newborns and for children, which today do not exist. So we take a catheter that is a meter and a half, uh, because that's the only catheter that we have. The technology exists, but the market is so small that the industry is not very interested in developing high technology for a very small market. And this is not, it's not simply the question of smaller arteries. It's a whole question of a different um, an anatomy that you're dealing with. It's a different anatomy. It's a different uh, uh, technology necessary for the stiffness, for example. You know, the blood vessels in children are more fragile in a sense, but on the other hand, they're more elastic. So they have their own specific the problems both technically uh, as well as physiological. One of the biggest questions that we have is if we take a device, for example a stent, that is developed for adults which have stopped growing and we put them in small children, what would happen to those vessels as we increase in, in size? And therefore, personally, we have a lot of uh, skepticism of using stands unless we are really forced. And the other side of the coin is we're going to press and push industry to develop bioactive or biodegradable devices so that if I put a stand in a little child uh, and that stand will then be reabsorbed, it will permit then the normal physiologic growth. Biodegradable, bioabsorbable, biocompatible. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the great, great, great potential expansion. If we can develop it for children, it can then be transferred to adults. Uh, what is interesting is that we've done very small devices based on trying to do it for pediatrics, and those have translated to go to the adult, which permits you to go to more distal circulation. I think that's very valuable for the training of physicians. You know, when I started, it was see one, do one, teach one. It no longer applies. We're not, it, it's, it's just so much better to train, and I'm very involved in the training of physicians, Training physicians in a in, in vitro model, uh, you know, get old. I mean, you actually today the reproduction is Dr. Morris so fantastic. You know, it's literally like the real thing. But then you get the physician to learn, you get the physician to train, you get the physician to try, you get the physician to make the mistake in a model. By the time you transfer that to the real patient, you have a much better trained physician. And I think industry is now more and more turning to these models. And the regulatory agencies are saying, wait a second, you not only have to go and train in a model first, make, you know, it used to be sometimes an animal. Then, you know, as you know, there's a lot of movement against training you know, in animals. So these things have replaced a lot of the training. The regulatory agencies will, will force us to train physicians in this type of models that are now readily available, 3D printing, can make exactly the same aneurysm immediately, right away. And not only that, can make, I can make 20 of those, or 50 or 100 to train physicians. So that I do believe uh, that following that comes the proctoring. In other words, now you're gonna go, this individual who's trained in the model is gonna go do humans. So when you go humans, you go with somebody with experience, they proctor you. I think that is absolutely the way to go.